All praise to the Ancient of Days, all esteem to the Most High Elohim. This is your brother L. We live at a time right now where the term toxic masculinity gets thrown out there a lot, specifically from the feminist crowd. And whenever people use the term toxic masculinity, what they are saying is that manhood in its purest form is harmful. What they're speaking about is misogyny. What they're speaking about is the mistreatment and abuse of women. Whenever they say toxic masculinity, these are the things that they're referring to. What I want to do in this discussion is go through the scriptures and I want us to truly understand the patriarchal leadership. And I want us to understand it out of its pure context. Because many times a lot of these people who speak of toxic masculinity, they are speaking of it in terms of having their mind evilly affected by looking at the leadership of the Western world. In many cases, they're looking at the Western world and how in the West that their ideas towards women have been. And they're taking that and using that to say that manhood, masculinity as a whole is harmful to the world. And nothing could be further from the truth. And that's why I want to have this discussion, because what we need to realize that nature itself is masculine. I'm going to say that again. Nature itself is masculine. Let's start at the book of Enoch, chapter 54, verse eight. And I'm going to show you what I mean by this, because we have to start with pointing out how nature itself is masculine so that we can set forth all these other examples that I'm going to show you that masculinity is not toxic. And I'm going to show you that patriarchy is not toxic. In fact, leadership itself is patriarchal. Leadership of anything, whether it be a family, leadership of a congregation, leadership of a business, leadership of a country, I'm going to show you some of these principles that are found in scripture, that leadership itself is patriarchal and that even when women take positions of leadership, that they even operate through a masculine principle. I'm going to go through scripture and show you this. And we're doing this to expose the hypocrisy of what the feminist movement is pushing by saying that masculinity is toxic. So what we got to do is start by looking at creation and nature itself. And we need to see the masculine principle at work in nature itself. The universe, the heavens and the earth, whatever you want to call it, but nature. Many years we've been deceived by the term mother nature, when in fact it should be described as father nature. And it's actually a moot point because there's no mother nature or father nature. There's the creator of the heavens and earth, the most high Elohim. And there's his spirit. There's his son. But let's go to the book of Enoch, chapter 54, verse eight. Listen to what it says about how nature is constructed. It says, and all the waters will be joined with the waters that are above the sky. The water that is above the sky is male and the water that is under the earth is female. Stop. In this scripture is describing the structure of the heavens and the earth. And you can check with any scientist. You can check with any meteorologist. Anybody that studies these things, they'll tell you that the water that is on the earth, the oceans, the seas, the rivers, the lakes, that all that water comes from above. So it's the water that is above that feeds into the earth that forms these bodies of water. So the water that is above that comes from above is more important because it feeds the earth. Whenever we talk about the rain that comes down from above, that makes the crops grow, that feeds the animals, the waters that come from above that cleanses out the defilement of the earth, the waters that come from above 
which saturate and nurture the planet so that things can be fruitful and multiply. The waters that come from above that we drink so that we can have sustenance and be self-sustained. The scripture says that those waters have a male principle, a masculine principle. And we know that this earth is over three quarters water. The earth is more water than it is land. And all that water that is contained on this earth comes from above. And the scriptures right here is telling us that those waters that are above have a male principle. Those waters that are above, they give life to the earth. They help the seeds grow. They give life to the waters and the earth beneath. And the scripture said that the water that is on the earth and under the earth is female, meaning those waters are the receivers. The waters below are the receivers of the waters coming from above. Doesn't that sound like a perfect balance between the male and female principle as we look at nature? That it's the waters above that feed the earth, just like it's the masculine male principle that is the life giver and gives into the woman. The woman receives seed from the man. It is the man that plants that life in the woman's womb, just like the waters rain down on the earth to water the seeds and cause fruit to grow. Let me read this again for you because we got to grasp this. We don't need to get our talking points from some of these online forums. We don't need to get our talking points from none of these feminists. All we got to do is just observe nature itself and see how nature itself is constructed. Enoch chapter 54, verse eight, and all the waters will be joined with the waters that are above the sky. The water that is above the sky is male and the water that is under the earth is female. So there we see the perfect balance, but we see that the masculine principle is the life giver. The masculine principle is the supporter. The masculine principle is what causes fruitfulness and multiplication. It's that masculine principle. Are you starting to see this? Look further out in nature. Look at how the animals behave. Do you see any of the animals given birth by their self? Or do you see the male principle giving life to the female animal and birth taking place? I've never seen a lion give birth by itself. I've never even seen a bird give birth by itself. It's the male principle, the male animal that feeds the seed into the woman and causes birth to take place. This is out in nature. This is something that cannot be denied. All we have to do is just study nature itself. And the most high, the creator of the universe is the one that set these things in place after his own image. That patriarchal leadership essence is seen throughout all creation. So it cannot be toxic if creation itself would not operate without that masculine principle. And I realize that creation itself would not operate without the feminine principle as well, because even right here in this verse, it talks about the waters under the earth that are female. They both work in unison. They both work together. I understand that. But when it comes to the weight of importance, the masculine principle, just like the waters that come from the heaven, that is what gives the life. The waters underneath would not exist without the waters above because everything that is beneath comes from that which is above. Are you seeing this? Let's go to some other scriptures in the book of second Enoch. What I need to do is go to the scriptures to establish the power of the masculine principle in creation. Let's read something about the most high. Let's go to the book of the secrets of Enoch chapter 24, starting at verse one. And let's listen to this conversation that the most high is having with Enoch as he explains the essence of creation. Listen to this. It says, and the most high summoned me and said to me, Enoch, sit down on my left with Gabriel. And I bowed down to the Most High, and the Most High spoke to me and said, Enoch, beloved, all that you see, 
All things that are standing finished, I tell to you even before the very beginning. All that I created from non-being and visible things from invisible. Hear Enoch and take in these my words. For not to my angels have I told my secret, and I have not told them their rise, nor my endless realm, nor have they understood my creating, which I tell you today. Pay very close attention to what the Most High now is about to say here in verse 4. The Most High says, For before all things were visible, I alone used to go about in the invisible things like the sun from east to west and from west to east. Stop. In these verses, the Most High has taken us back to even before the angels were created. He's taken us back to even before the heavens and earth works created. And he's saying that he went out alone by himself and he pondered on creation. Listen to this. So you sisters, this explains to you that we as men made in the most high's own image while we enjoy having our space. That's why they call such thing as a man cave because there are times where we as men made in the image of the most high, we also need our space and our solitude just for us and our own thoughts. Because the scripture here is telling us that the most high himself used to do that, used to go off by himself alone, just to ponder on his creation, just to be in his own company and to plan to get motivated to do the work that he was about to do. So for, for you sisters, that's wondering why us brothers need our time in solitude and need our space. This is why, because we're made in the image of our father. And this is why we have that in our nature. Hallelujah. We even see this with the most high son, the Messiah, how he often would go into solitude on the mountain to be by himself. Any man can tell you that when he has peace of mind and he's able to be to himself for a certain period of time, that you're able to get more clarity of thought. You're able to get more motivation on how to lead your family. You're able to hear from the most high because leadership is patriarchal. I'm going to say that again. Leadership is patriarchal. So to the point that even women who get in positions of power, they operate in that position of power from the male principle. Have you ever had a female boss, a female supervisor? In many cases, did they not overcompensate in their harshness in being in that leadership position? We can even take a look at scripture. Take a look at Mother Deborah when she was judge in Israel. Did she not still operate from a masculine principle because she was a woman of war? She was out there popping heads and killing for the most high. So even when Mother Deborah was judge in Israel, she operated from a masculine principle. And even at that, when she was judge in Israel, she connected up with Barak. She connected up with Barak and both of them went to war. So even with Mother Deborah's anointing, as powerful and anointed as she was, much respect and honor to Mother Deborah. She still connected with the masculine principle in Barak and the way that she judged the nation. Her leadership style was still masculine and how she carried out warfare. And in how she stood on principle, just like the Most High does, how he rules the heavens and the earth. Once again, look at nature. Everything operates on a principle that can't be broken. Look at the waves of the ocean. They only go so far and they have to stop because the Most High told them to do that. Look at the sun. Look at the moon. Look at all these aspects of creation that they follow a law, meaning they follow a routine. They follow a principle and they can't break that principle. That's the masculine essence right there, because masculinity sets things in order. Masculinity creates structure. Masculinity makes things secure and creation itself is secure because of 
the masculine essence of the most high. Leadership is patriarchal. This is undeniable. And this is why in scripture, you will always see the most high refer to nations and peoples in a feminine form. Let's go to some of those scriptures so we can lay more precedent. I'm making the point here that leadership is, pat is patriarchal. Check this out. Let's go to some verses so I can give you some examples of how the most high refers to the nations and the peoples in the feminine form. Let's start out at Isaiah chapter 44, beginning at verse one. It says, sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud. Thou that didst not travail with child, for more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife. Enlarge the place of thy tent and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitations. Spare not, lengthen thy cords and strengthen thy stakes. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither be thou confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame. For thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth and shalt not remember the reproach of thy widowhood any more. Verse five, listen to this. For thy maker is thy husband. For thy maker is thy husband. The sovereign of hosts and his is his name and thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the Elohim of the whole earth shall he be called for the most high called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit and a wife of youth when thou wast refused. There the most high is referring to his people in the feminine aspect. Let's go to some other verses. I'm showing you here that leadership is patriarchal. Let's go to Hosea chapter two, starting at verse one. It says, say ye unto your brethren, I me and to your sisters, Ruama, plead with your mother, for she is not my wife, neither am I her husband. Let her therefore put away her whoredoms out of her sight and her adulteries from between her breast, lest I strip her naked and set her as in the day that she was born and make her as a wilderness and set her like a dry land and slay her with thirst. And I will not have mercy upon her children, for they be the children of whoredoms. For their mother played the harlot. She that conceived them have done shamefully, for she said, I will go after my lovers that give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, mine oil and my drink. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up thy way with thorns and make a wall that she shall not find her paths. And she shall follow after her lovers, but she shall not overtake them. And she shall seek them, but shall not find them. Then shall she say, I will go and return to my first husband, for then was it better with me than now. For she did not know that I gave her corn and wine and oil and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. Therefore will I return and take away my corn in the time thereof and my wine in the season thereof and will recover my wool and my flax given to cover her nakedness. And now will I discover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers and none shall deliver her out of mine hand. I will also cause all her mirth to cease her feast days, her new moons and her Sabbaths and all her solemn feasts. And I will destroy her vines and her fig trees, whereof she hath said, These are my rewards that my lovers have given me, and I will make them a forest, and the beast of the field shall eat them. And I will visit upon her the days of Baalim, wherein she burned incense to them, and she decked herself with her earrings and her jewels, and she went after her lovers and forgot me. So the father is talking to his people as if it is an unfaithful woman. Once again, that's patriarchy. Speaking of what took place from the metaphor of the people having a feminine nature. And in a minute, I'm going to talk about how very true that is, that when we're dealing with groups of people, it could be anything, whether it's people that you supervising at your job, whether it be you lead in a congregation, whether it be you lead in a country, whatever leadership position you're in, you could be managing a restaurant. The people that you're managing, that whole group, they have a feminine essence. 
I'm going to go through this in a moment, but let me finish. Verse 14, it says, therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. And I will give her her vineyards from thence and the valley of our core for a door of hope. And she shall sing there as in the days of her youth and as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. And it shall be at that day, saith the Most High, that thou shalt call me Ishi, that means husband, and shall no more call me Bali. For I will take away the names of Balim out of her mouth, and they shall no more be remembered by their name. And in that day will I make a covenant for them with the beast of the field and fowls of the heaven, and I will betroth thee unto me forever. I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. I will even betroth me unto thee in faithfulness, and thou shalt know the Most High. There you see the Most High is speaking about his people in the feminine form, and he is the masculine form, the patriarchal leadership. Leadership is patriarchal. Something very interesting that we know this is very true. Even when you hear men speak about something that they are very fond of, whether it be their vehicle, whether it be their guns, most men, whenever you hear them talk about something that they're very fond of, they will say she or her like, yeah, I, I just took her to get her wheels fixed. I just took her to get the oil changed. Yeah, I just took her to get a paint job. Whenever they talk about something that they're fond of, they speak about it in the feminine essence. And sisters, I'm not saying that you are equal to being an item. I'm not saying that a woman is equal to a vehicle. I'm showing you that even within our essence as men, since we're made in the image of the most high, since we are fond of the feminine essence, which men should be, if they haven't bought into the homosexual agenda, then things that we are fond of, we speak about it in the feminine essence. Even when you hear brothers talk about their, their weapons, They'll talk about, yeah, I just I just got an extended clip for her. Yeah, I, I just cleaned her up. They speak about even their guns in the feminine aspect. This is just something that is within us. Why? Because it's within the most high and leadership is patriarchal. Now, let's go back to what I said a few moments ago about the people that you manage. The whole group has a feminine aspect to it. Anybody in a leadership position can tell you this, that whenever you dealing and managing and leading a large group of people, that it's like they're a woman because a woman's nature is to have swings of the mood. A woman's nature is that she needs to be instructed. She needs to get clear, precise directions. She needs to be told what to do, how to do it. And she needs to see you set the example of how to do what you're telling her to do. And when you're in a leadership position, whether you manage in a restaurant or run in a country, you have to deal with the people the exact same way. The people are very moody and unstable. People that you manage, there's all different types of attitudes that you have to manage there's all different type of scenarios that they come into you for the solution, similar to like your woman would. She's expecting you to have the solution. She's expecting you to take care of business, just like the people that you're set over to lead. And people that are in leadership positions, they know that people change all the time. People will get frustrated and mad at you, just like your woman will. And you have to know how to be patriarchal in your leadership, because if you manage in a group of people and they see you being unstable, they see you not keeping your word. They see you not even doing the things that you're telling them to do. You're going to lose credibility. You're going to lose respect, just like you do with your woman. Whenever she sees you don't keep your word, whenever she sees that you're double minded and unstable, you don't stick with decisions that you make. She feels like she can't trust your leadership. So that's why some women rebel whenever they see that they are up under weak leadership. 
And that's why in many workplaces and even in whole entire nations and countries, when people see that the leadership is weak, whenever people see that those in leadership don't know what they're doing, they're going to rebel. They're going to buck against the program because they see that you're not stable. They see that you're not focused. They see that you aren't truly in your patriarchal aspect because leadership is supposed to be patriarchal. Whenever you make a decision, you stand on it. You're supposed to have the vision. You're supposed to have the plan in manhood and in leadership. Because with these feminists, they'll talk about toxic masculinity, this toxic masculinity, that. But these are the exact same ones that will get upset if a man doesn't jump in and help them if they getting raped in the street. Whenever something goes down, the first thing they'll do is call some police officers to come help them with big guns showing up all manly to help them when somebody breaking in their house or something of that nature. The first thing that they do is call for the help of a man. This is facts. So patriarchy is not toxic because nature itself shows that. Patriarchy is what keeps everything in order and everything structured. That's not saying that the feminine aspect isn't important. It's just saying that the masculine aspect is what keeps everything secure and in order. And we can see examples all throughout scripture that those who were set up as leaders and servants of the most High's people, they had to deal with them as a man would deal with a woman. A woman ain't just going to sit there and listen to you say, I love you. That needs to be shown through actions. So whenever we look at a situation like with King David, whenever Ziklag had got burned and they came and kidnapped his wives and his children. And when that happened, all his soldiers, all the people that he was leading, they was ready to rebel against him because they was looking at him like why you didn't protect us. Even though these was grown men who was also fighters and warriors, the feminine aspect of the group came out because everybody was looking at David saying, how come you didn't protect us? How come you didn't lead us? And that's what I'm talking about when I say that groups of people that you lead, they have a feminine aspect because they're looking to you for leadership. Whenever you're leading a group, you have to be the masculine principle. You have to be the patriarchal principle. You have to direct them, instruct them, and you have to show them by example. This is why David, whenever all the people was about to turn against him, the scripture said they was even about to stone him, that he encouraged himself. He went to that place of solitude as a man, like many of us need to do, and he encouraged himself. And then they went about going to get back their wives and their children and they went into that village and slaughtered all those people who kidnapped his family. And then the army and all the people he was leading, all of a sudden they started loving him again. But their mood swang. As soon as something wasn't going right, or as soon as they felt like David wasn't being in his patriarchal role as the leader, they started having mood swings against him, just like a woman would. This is why us as the men of the most high, we have to understand this, that leadership is patriarchal. So there's certain principles that we always got to stand on 10 toes down. Those are the principles of manhood. Those are the principles of patriarchy. We got to stand on those principles when leading ourself, leading our families, or if we're set up as leaders of others. Because we always talk about the kingdom, the kingdom, this, the kingdom, that we're going to rule in the kingdom. We're going to do this and that in the kingdom. We're going to be on top and not on bottom. Well, guess what? Whenever you're ruling nations, you have to understand that it's no different than you have an authority and you have a responsibility for your woman. If you want to know how you would do with ruling nations, take a look at how you handle your wife or your woman. If you want to know how you would handle ruling nations, 
Take a look at how you manage that group of people on the job that you supervise. Take a look at how you manage that basketball, baseball team that you coach. Take a look at how you handle those groups of people, whether they be small or large, that you are in responsibility over right now. Guess what? If you are not following the principles of patriarchal leadership right now, even over your family or over the uh, group of people that you supervise and that you've been made responsible for, guess what? You probably wouldn't be fit to lead and rule nations in the kingdom either. Because I remember some wise words from a brother several years ago, and he was giving me some counsel about marriage. And what he was telling me is that how you deal with your wife and how you deal with that feminine aspect, it's a test to see whether you will be fit and qualified to deal with rulership in the kingdom. Ain't that something? That's how deep it gets, family. That's how deep it gets. That the Most High and the Messiah, they take note how we handle leadership. And for the brothers that's not married, guess what? The Father is looking at how you handle that group of people that you supervise on the job. That group of people that you supervise, whether it be wh whoever, if you are in a position where you lead any group of people, large or small, that group of people is similar to a woman. Because like I said, groups have feminine aspects. Anything that you lead and you're being looked at as the leader, you have to have that patriarchal masculine essence to lead that group of people as if it was a woman. Because when you're dealing with people, they have the same nature as a woman. Groups of people are fickle. Groups of people are very difficult to please. Groups of people, they don't know what they want or when they want it or how they want it. They just know they want it. <laughs> and doesn't that explain the nature of a woman perfectly? And this is why the father watches how we handle leadership. So to the point where Moses wasn't allowed in the promised land because he allowed the people to take him off his square. Whenever the people were murmuring and complaining like women do. Moses got angry and upset and struck the rock and the most high didn't tell him to do that. So what ended up taking place, if we want to use a metaphor. Moses allowed the feminine aspect of the people, their fickleness, their whining, their complaining, their murmuring to take him off his manhood square. He got into his emotions. So he started getting into his feminine aspect because he was dealing with the feminine aspect of the people. So him striking the rock, that was not manly. It was not manly because he allowed his emotions to supersede his patriarchal logic. He allowed his emotions to get him all dramatic like a woman would be. So the father judged him for that. Let's take a look at Saul, King Saul. Whenever Samuel told him to wait before he gave that offering, what did Saul do? He listened to the people. He let the people talk him in to doing what Samuel told him not to do. That's similar to a man that lets a woman pretty much lead him around and tell him what to do, even if what she's saying goes against the most high that he wants to please her more than standing on righteous manly principles that the father would have him to stand on as a patriarch. There's a word for that simp. That's a simp. It's not just a simp to allow a woman to dominate and control and lead you. It's also a simp. If you feed into the desires of the people, if you feed into the desire of the, the masses, it's the same thing as simping out to a woman because you're allowing the multitudes and the people and whatever group to change your values as a man. So now you're not leading them. They're leading you. And that's why the most high's judgment was so harsh on Saul. And he said, you're not fit to lead my people. I'm going to I'm going to remove you from the throne of king. Why? 
because the most high knows what I'm saying in this discussion, that leadership is patriarchal. And the minute that you go off those patriarchal principles, not only will it make your woman look at you with a side eye as you are unworthy to lead her, not only will it make the groups of people who are looking to you for leadership, look at you with a side eye and start doubting you, but it will even make the most high deem you as unworthy to be in that position of leadership because now you're moving off patriarchal principles and being guided by emotions. Instead of standing on what you know, the father would have you to stand on. Let's go back and take a look at nature. Do the waters above change what they do? Because of the waters beneath? Nah. The waters above and the rain that comes down is not going to change its program because of what's going on with the waters on the earth. Remember what I said at the beginning? The waters above are male and masculine. The waters beneath are female. So it's not going to stop raining just because the oceans and seas and lakes want it to stop raining. In fact, the oceans, lakes, and all that, they need that rain to fall so that they can still operate. And the water below just goes right back up and evaporates into the air and feeds right back to the waters of the air. That's how the Most High set it up, to be a cycle. But that cycle of leadership is patriarchal. This is why all throughout Scripture, whenever it traces the lineage, it traces it through the Father. So-and-so, the son of so-and-so, so-and-so, the son of so-and-so. Even the camps and tribes of Israel was set up according to their father's house. Hallelujah. Let's even take a look at the Messiah, the one whom we say we love, the one whom we say that by his blood and by the word of our testimony that we overcome the enemy. The Most High saw fit to make the Messiah a man. If the masculine principle didn't matter, if leadership was not patriarchal, then why would the Most High make the Messiah, the one that we have to go through to get eternal life, why would he make him a man? The Messiah was not a woman. The Messiah was a man, a Hebrew male. This is undeniable facts. So patriarchal leadership in the flesh of the Messiah is masculine and is male. And this needs to be said because that feminist spirit I'm noticing is trying to creep into Hebrew circles. It's trying to creep into conscious awakened Hebrews. And some of these feminists are bringing these ideas in and even some men are starting to bow down to those ideas. You even have some of the men now that are calling themselves Hebrews and Israelites who are bringing these doctrines in to put the feminine over the masculine. That's not how the father would have it. And this is what we need to understand in order for our kingdom and our nation and our people to operate at the highest level that it's supposed to. We need to understand that leadership is patriarchal. And those of us in leadership, we have to stand on those patriarchal principles. Whenever the Messiah rules his kingdom, it says that he will rule with an iron rod. That's masculine. That's security. That's law. That's order. That's manhood. It doesn't say that he's going to rule with a gentle, delicate flower. It doesn't say that he's going to rule soft spoken and whispering. It said he's going to rule with the iron rod. That's the masculine principle. That's the male principle. He's bringing his kingdom that is in heaven to the earth. Hallelujah. These are things that we have to revisit and things that we need to know because us as the people the scripture says what? That we are the bride of the Messiah and the Most High. Let's check it out. Let's go to Revelation chapter 19, starting at verse 6. It says, 
And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Most High Omnipotent reign. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. You see? So it's talking about the marriage of the Most High to his people. And all the way from Genesis, all the way to Revelation, he's referring to his people in the feminine tone. Why? Because leadership is patriarchal. So us men of the Most High, we need to return to the ancient patriarchy. The ancient patriarchy that has always been the hierarchy of our people. The ancient patriarchy that is the hierarchy of nation and creation itself. We need to return to that patriarchy and stand confident, secure, ten toes down in that divine position that the father has put us in as men who serve the father. Hallelujah. Let this be an inspiration to the brothers for us to return to that righteous patriarchy and to truly be in the image of our father. Then when the sisters see that we are in our rightful place, they will come into their rightful place. But as long as they see a bunch of Negroes running around, running their mouth, but are not worthy of leadership, they will not serve you in that place of leadership if they see that you are unworthy of that place of leadership. So it's on us, brothers, to return to that position of patriarchy and leadership. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All praise. I pray that this message fell on good ears and good hearts. And I pray that the father would cause it to be fruitful and multiply in your soul. Before I go, I want to make brothers and sisters aware of some of the works of the ministry that we have released. A great project that we have released is the 613 Laws of Torah audiobook. This is a five hour long audiobook narrated by myself and it contains all 613 laws of Torah. It only has the laws and commands. There's no other extra commentary, just the laws and commands. In the audio book, I'm narrating the laws and commands from the King James Version. We don't use any of the pagan names like God or Lord. It's all law, all translated from the King James. And in the audio book, I also give you the chapters and verses where the laws are found so you can follow along on your own as well as you listen. We put together this audio book because the scripture tells us in Joshua chapter one, verse seven and eight, that we are commanded to meditate on the laws and commands every day. Whenever we rise up and whenever we go to sleep, we need to be meditating on the laws and commands. And since we live in a time where things are fast paced, we're constantly on the go. It's good to have the laws and commands in audio book form so you can download it to your phone. You can download it to your iPad, your tablet, your desktop, your laptop. You can listen to the laws and commands on the go while you're going to work, while you're at work, while you're working out in the gym, while you're cooking in the kitchen, while you're going to sleep at night. You can have those laws and commands playing in the background. And by listening to the laws and commands over and over and over again, it causes your mind to digest and internalize those laws. And it puts a desire within you to keep those laws because you're constantly meditating on them. Hallelujah. So we put together that audio book. It's five hours long with only the laws and commands. I'm going to put the link in the description box underneath this video on how you can download that audio book and invest in that project. Once again, it's the 613 Laws of Torah narrated by myself, Brother L. Check out the link in the description box underneath this video on how to possess that item for yourself. Another project that we have released is the Words of the Messiah audiobook. This is a four hour long audiobook, also narrated by myself, and it's also narrated from the King James Version with no pagan names. This audio book contains the wise sayings and parables of the Messiah. We put together this audio book because the Messiah is our king. He's the Torah in the flesh. Not once did he ever break his father's law. So we put together this audio book so that brothers and sisters can meditate on the words of the Messiah. 
And by doing that, we learn better how to worship the Most High in spirit and in truth and follow in the footsteps of the Messiah. So I'm going to also put the link in the description box underneath this video on how you can download that Words of the Messiah audio book and invest in that project. Another project that we have done is the Words of the Father audio book. This is a 14 hour long audio book, also narrated by myself. It contains the words of the father recorded in scripture that he spoke out of his own mouth or through the inspiration of the prophets all the way from Genesis, where he said, let there be light all the way to the new Testament, where he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased all the words of the father, because we are made in his image. And he represents that patriarchal leadership. The most high created all creation. His signature of masculinity and the divine masculine is seen all throughout creation. So we put together an audio book where brothers and sisters can meditate on his words for the scripture says that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the most high does man live. So we literally put together a 14 hour long audio book where you can meditate solely on the words of the father. Hallelujah. I'll also put the link in the description box underneath this video on how you can download and invest in that Words of the Father audio book. All praise. Another campaign and project we have going on is the Hebrews for Excellence and Exodus campaign. The scripture says that the truth must be taught to all four corners of the earth. So through the Hebrews for Excellence and Exodus, we are traveling from city to city all over the United States, all over the world traveling city to city to do baptisms, to preach and teach. We've been to San Diego, Jamestown, Virginia. We're going to be going to New York City later uh, in this calendar year of 2019. Whenever we go to these cities, we'll be having meetings with brothers and sisters to talk about launching home fellowships, home businesses, doing homeschooling. We will be acquiring land here in January. We're going to be acquiring land in Georgia and also in Arkansas. We're going to be going to these cities and visiting the homeless shelters, the orphanages, the jails, the prisons, the hospitals to minister to our people. So that's the work of the Hebrews for Excellence and Exodus campaign. For those who are interested in traveling with us and supporting us, you can find my email in the description box underneath this video. Let me know if you're willing to support and travel with us and have boots on the ground to do some work for the most high. For those who are interested in offering monetary donations, you can also find a link in the description box underneath this video on how you can donate to the Hebrews for Excellence and Exodus campaign fund. Other than that, I thank y'all for your prayers. I thank y'all for listening to these discussions. These are meant to empower us to endure to the end with victory, success and destiny. Keep going. Shalom.